Two interviews being posted now are from highly intelligent men from different ends of the political spectrum in Australia. Peter Baldwin served in the Hawke Labor government and Tony Abbott of course is extremely well known in more recent times as a former Prime Minister uh, and uh, a thinker at large. Both men are people that I respect greatly. They have a different perspective on good policy but both have a deep commitment to improving Australia and the society we live in according to the way they see the world. More importantly, what emerges from these two talks, I think, is that they both respect and understand the need for debate, perhaps robust, but debate. Debate that is respectful, that can be vigorous, uh, but which focuses on the issues, not on the personalities. I hope you'll find them both interesting. I suggest that looking at one uh, would uh, necessitate looking at the other. Peter, welcome to a conversation about modern Australia. You and I, I think, uh, you know, you were in the parliament for a long time. We overlapped. You were a very senior minister on the other side of the political divide to me. Uh, we now, though, find, I think it's fair to say, a great deal more we have in common as Australians than we have uh, to separate us and to differentiate us. I think that's important because it seems to me today that we focus on things that divide us all the time, not things that pull us together. You are a man of serious intellect. Uh, you write a lot. You've been writing a lot about freedom of speech, uh, about the changing nature of left-wing politics, about the need for uh, people not to reject their culture but to build on it, lest they lose their cultural and economic strength and are not able to serve their own people and indeed other people in the world uh, well. Um, can I ask you firstly how you think politics on the left has changed and in particular this modern thing that people talk about, identity politics, what does it mean? Yeah, so the, um, the thing that disturbs me about the way the left's gone in recent times is the embrace of so-called identity politics. Now, the essence of identity, the, the left used to be fully on board with the enlightenment conception of human of a common humanity, that what um, the important thing about us that unites us with people of different races, genders, uh, creeds, etc., was that we're part of the same of the same humanity. Identity politics basically contends that we are first and foremost a member of one or other categories, based either on race or gender or sexual orientation or whatever. So it so, emphasises our differences rather than the things we have in common. Yes, it, 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 it basically, you know, you, you see contributions from people who've embraced the identity politics mindset where they say, uh, prefix everything with, a, with something like, as a black, I think this, or as a gay, I think this, or, what, or as a Muslim, I think this, rather than, uh, and, and that sort of uh, way of thinking about yourself uh, is the essence of it. And I, I think it's profoundly retrograde. It's interesting that as recently as 1992, the, uh, the old Marxist historian Eric Hobsbawm, who, who wrote you know, a series of major histories uh, of the Western world, uh, gave a speech where he said, what is this identity politics? This has nothing to do with the left. The, you know, the left is about common humanity and improving the lot of a common humanity. It's not about uh, looking at this or that particular identity group. And uh, I just see it as profoundly retrograde. And one of the most objectionable things about it is that if you're a member of an identity group, well, identity groups come in two categories. There are those that are oppressed and those that are oppressor. So if you're a white male, well, of course, you're part of an oppressor group. I mean, you might be impoverished and uh, a person with very little power or influence whatsoever, but that white skin marks you out, yes, uh, as somebody who, who is inherently privileged. And um, uh, the, another aspect of it is that you're expected to stick to a script that relates to your identity group. So, for example, and somebody who, who 
departs from the script is a sort of a traitor. Um, Sarah Hayder, who uh, I mentioned when we were discussing earlier, uh, is a, a young American uh, of Pakistani Muslim background uh, who defected from the Islamic religion and got involved in setting up a group called the Ex-Muslims of North America. She uh, said in a, a very interesting speech to the American Humanist Association that um, after she defected, she expected hostility from Islamic groups, but she got equal hostility from left-wing groups who attached labels to her like Uncle Tom, House Muslim, Native Informant. So what that in effect says is she's not a human being with rationality and agency and the ability to make judgments about the cultural milieu into which she's born. She's uh, a Muslim and she must stick to that identity. And to fail to do that uh, is, is tantamount to a kind of treason. Now, there's a sense in which, I, you know, I, I think this is, you could almost say this, this is a racist mentality. I found that pro profoundly objectionable. It's interesting, uh, there's all sorts of things to unpack in that. Uh, I just make the observation that when I went to Canberra as a young man, I was often found myself in quite deep sympathy with people at the left end of the Labor Party because of their concern for the worth and dignity of individuals wherever they fitted into the socio-economic sort of class in the country. The, the mm. debate was a bit more simple in those days, I suppose. Uh, and, and, and as a conservative, I feel that the very basis of our freedom is that old saying, Jack's as good as his master or, you know, Jack's as good as his mate. We all need to recognise one another's worth and dignity. And now that seems to be lost in the idea that we need to elevate some people who have been victims. Would you elaborate on what I'm really putting there, which is the idea that this sort of identity politics feeds into the idea of victimhood. So you have people who are not able to get ahead because they are the victims of the system or of prejudice in the broader society or whatever. And what seems to me to be almost the impossibility today of addressing victims' concerns and redressing uh, their, uh, their victimhood. Yes, well, one of the problems with, with all this is that uh, there's very little emphasis on actually achieving a result for the people who are victimised. I mean, the classic illustration of that is the Black Lives Matter movement in America, which is supposedly about, you know, preserving black lives. Um, what, what they've in fact achieved is a situation where uh, the police in America uh, are so intimidated that uh, they're reluctant to carry out the kind of proactive law enforcement, you know, the looking for people who seem to be doing something potentially dangerous, so going out and actively questioning people and so forth, which, and the approach to policing, which has been so effective in bringing down homicide rates and other crime rates over, over a period of decades. That's all gone into reverse. Um, the cops are so terrified of, um, and this is confirmed by you know, law enforcement officials in America and, and also, but the, the statistical evidence on what's happened uh, to crime rates is really quite stunning. It, it's just that long-term decline has gone into sharp reverse and uh, especially in inner urban areas, um, the, the, in, there's an incre the total number of uh, uh, increase in homicides over a period of a year, it, it was something like 900 uh, in total. And so in other words, a, a movement that was supposedly about protecting black lives by disempowering the police, who were the only thing that stands between people living in these ghettos and uh, uncontrolled gang violence, by disempowering the police, they've greatly in, uh, increased the risk of them falling victim to gang-related violence. In other words, it's been completely counterproductive. And that, but that's not of no concern to, to those who promulgate identity politics. It, it, it just doesn't figure. Uh, well, that actually it, makes it easier for them to continue to run their own narrative. You don't want the problem solved. No, that ends no, the no. There's somebody, somebody made the, an interesting analogy once that um, uh, 
social justice warriors in this sense uh, no more want to eliminate the sort the problem, whether it be it poverty or violence, than um, than the lions want to eliminate the herds of antelope and impalas on the uh, African steppe. I think there's something in that that. Um, uh, the left used to say, uh, let's get past these, the things that divide us. Let's, let's um, you know, Martin Luther King expressed it perfectly in his great civil rights speech of 1963, where he, he said he looked forward to the day when his children would be judged by the content of their character, not the colour of their, their skin. skin. And, but Brilliant now, words. Um, ra racial distinctions have to be perpetuated. The sense of grievance and victimhood has to be perpetuated. Uh, white people, people with that dreaded white skin, are supposed to be permanently have a, a sense of guilt about things that they may or may not have had anything to do with. It's just pernicious stuff. And, um, and we're starting, you know, you, you, eventually you get a reaction to it. And in America, uh, the Democratic Party has discovered to its cost, if you, if you keep deprecating people, calling them deplorables and so forth, well, they might um, decide to, to spit in your eye. And um, hence we have President Donald J. Trump, which I don't think was the result that the Democratic Party was interested in achieving. Well, I'd, I think I would suggest to you that what's actually happened there is that people have just said, we've had absolutely enough of this. And in many ways, their diagnosis that we, you know, everything was in a mess and needed cleaning out was probably right. The danger is that they find the wrong solution. And that, to me, is very threatening as somebody who actually believes that for whatever differences, for example, you and I might have had, we've been able to resolve those through a parliamentary process where we understood the rules of debate, there was some basic respect and boundaries that you didn't transcend, uh, and we found compromises. But we agreed on some things. I think one of them would be that our past in the West was not a terrible thing at all. There was much to celebrate, much more to do, but much to celebrate. It seems to be now that we're in academia and so much of um, the thinking in the public square, into a, we're into a full-blown sort of self-loathing of our past. Mm. And much of it is not only based on ignorance, it's actually based on lies. Yeah, well, there's a, a, a failure to recognise the magnitude of what was achieved. Yeah. Certainly there were defects. Uh, there was racism, there was uh, colonialism, uh, you know, there was slavery, at, uh, uh, if you go back far enough. And that shouldn't be denied, that, that, that should be honestly acknowledged. But uh, if you look at the kind of society that we have in Western countries, uh, not exclusively Western countries, but but... You know, there's no time in the history of the human race where people have, uh, a, a broad range of people, been able to live as well uh, as, as we can uh, enjoy in, in the sort of, you know, that all people, not all, but there, is, there are some severely disadvantaged groups, but overall, uh, what other civilization has produced an equal prospect of a good life to, to, to the kind of civilization that we live in? But the, the trouble with so much of uh, the critique of that is that it, in many ways it's essentially nihilistic. But we talked about the free speech issue. Um, this one thing that profoundly disturbs me is that the premise that people should be able to assemble peacefully and hear a point of view, uh, the right to lawful assembly and, and to freedom of speech just isn't accepted by some people. I mean, I, I experienced this firsthand at Sydney University when I was attending a, um, a talk being given by a, an Israeli, a, a, not an Israeli, by a, a speaker who was defensive of the Israeli position. I believe every Australian of reading age and capability should read the piece you wrote about that. Right. It was well, a superb piece. Yeah. Uh, and, and I commend it to anyone who may be listening to this conversation. Basically what happened is that uh, the, the, the speaker was um, Richard Kemp, who was for a period commander of UK forces in Afghanistan, and the topic of his talk was the ethical challenges that face military forces 
who are opposed by groups that embed themselves in the civilian population. How do you, how do you, you know, there's some awful moral dilemmas that inevitably crop up. That, that was the topic of his talk. But, um, uh, but he, he, he became notorious uh, amongst the, the so-called BDS brigade that are hostile to Israel because he was somewhat defensive of Israel's military over the Gaza conflict in 2014. So part way through the talk, they burst in. A uh, young woman with a megaphone shouted him down. The whole thing was actually quite disturbing. But that's the, that's the norm. Uh, you know, a, a speaker who might be inclined to defend the Israeli position all over universities, all over the Western world, it can expect to find themselves subject to that. And, you know, you read in America, um, at, at rallies, you see these so-called Antifa, or black bloc people turning up, people in, you know, dressed in black, masked, uh, come along and uh, groups that they define as Nazis, which is anybody to the right of them, essentially. Uh, they think it's legitimate to, to physically attack them. And um, this gets very, very ugly, and you know, sometimes it, it explodes into lethal violence, as, as we've just seen. But just about that mindset that if somebody's saying something you don't like, it's legitimate to shut them down, that is something which nowadays seems to come almost exclusively from the left or a, a, an element of the left, let me put it that way. Not that you know, most people on the left wouldn't agree with that, but um, there's an element that, that seems to be able to get away with it. And that's especially the case on university campuses. So we, we, we've reached a lamentable point where universities, which are supposed to be where places where people can have their preconceptions challenged and hear sharply divergent viewpoints, uh, with any issue which is genuinely contentious, they are among the least free places in our societies these days. That is a, an absolutely lamentable state of affairs. I personally think it's a very frightening state of affairs. Uh, English, uh, the well left of centre by his own description, writer Frank uh, Ferretti, has been uh, uh, saying some very interesting things on this. He's got a book, What's Gone Wrong in Our Universities. He says when I, he was a campus activist in the 60s, it was all about teasing out the boundaries, much to the horror of our senior generations and what have you, but we're out there testing every idea, pushing all the boundaries. So it's now the precisely the opposite is happening. He makes the point, uh, and I don't think I'm misrepresenting his position here, that whole courses now, particularly in the humanities, will be written in ways that are designed not to present evidence at all points, challenge thinking, but not to offend, not to, offend, not to insult. Mm. And we talk about A, D and C as though that's the issue, but I'm not wondering whether this isn't, because he then says, that's backed up by everything from microaggression policies to safe places for students who feel offended through to um, uh, platform denying, and it's at its worst, Academics feel that it's almost not worth challenging the students because someone might complain and they'll go to a safe place and then the academic will end up before some sort of kangaroo court having to justify their actions and their career could be put on hold or at worst destroyed because they've offended someone. And he makes the point that this may potentially be disastrous for public debate. I would have thought all the more so now because so many people go through university. Yeah, um, the... Um Social psychologist Jonathan Haidt mm. uh, has uh, set up a, a, an organisation which he calls the Heterodox Academy, which uh, uh, has arose from his recognition that there's just, uh, in social sciences and, and the humanities in universities throughout the Western world, you're almost getting a, an ideological monoculture. Um, there have been some surveys of, that, that show this very starkly, it's, uh, as Haight puts it. it used to, it's always been the case that academia in, in those areas has tended to lean left. But in recent years, it, it's, it's become, you know, as he puts it, or, or just absolutely overwhelming. You know, if you're a conservative, you really have to watch your step. And, and even liberals, so-called, in the American sense, liberals, uh, uh, the, the, you're starting to see articles with titles like um, 
This one appeared in, the, I think it was in the, uh, one of the major American publications. I'm a liberal academic and my liberal students terrify me. He's giving a lecture, you know, just one misidentified gender category, one misused gender pronoun, one, you know, just one slip. And he can be, he can be, you know, there can be complaints, there can be demonstrations. Yeah. Uh, they, they just walk on eggshells, and that's not the conservatives even. These, these are, and um, so it's just appalling. And um, when you get that sort of monoculture, I mean, what is the purpose of a university if if, if, if people can't hear a, a diversity of viewpoints? Again, I don't think I'd be misquoting him, but Jonathan Haidt makes the point that. If, uh, if, if young people, he quotes John Stuart Mill, um, it, it, you, no matter how passionately you hold a view, if you've not heard the other side and understood it mm. and tested your understanding and learned how to defend it, your view is of no use at all. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, very strong view. And he's saying this will be, you know, really serious for the West. Mm. Um, and we might come back to that in a moment. Uh, uh, I think what he's doing is extraordinarily interesting. A bit easier in the American context. Uh, here, so much of our university uh, funding comes directly from the government um, and they don't seem to have the willpower to sort of insist on some diversity. They talk diversity, but where you're getting a narrowing of views, a, a narrower range of diverse views and opinions, of course, in our universities. This is deeply troubling, but it feeds into something that, that, that I believe very passionately. How are we ever going to get good policy without restoring quality debate? Well, I, I agree entirely. That, uh, but the, the essence of uh, what you might call the politically correct mindset is that if you hear a viewpoint, you don't... You know, uh, the, the benign uh, response to hearing different viewpoints or views you disagree with is to say, well, uh, I disagree with what you say for the following reasons, and then you provide reasons. Was the, uh, the PC response is to say, I'm offended by yeah. what you say and you, should not ha you do not have the right to say it and the fact that you choose to say it marks you as a bad person. You know. <laughs> uh, and um, so it, it's utterly corrosive and corrupting uh, of, of worthwhile debate. Just to go back to something you said earlier, you know, you sort of talked about the, the left's at its best and I respected this and I still do, commitment to universalism you know, elevation of the worth and dignity of everyone so we recognise our shared humanity. You know, this stuff uh, uh, of, 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 of basically saying if you disagree with you, you're a bad person, this victimhood stuff, mm. it strikes me... I heard a fellow say the other day, uh, you know, uh, uh, an English uh, thinker, said in the West we've moved from a sort of mixture of a, what might be called a dignity and an honour culture you know, where you had dignity if you had bearing and your decency and what have you, had honour if you were, a, you know, a person who behaved with honour, I suppose you'd say. Mm -hmm. We've morphed now into a sort of victimhood culture where if you want to be put up in lights on the media, it tends not to be so much because you've been an honourable person or a dignity person, it's because you can show that you're a victim in some way. Mm -hmm. And then two big problems arise, and I think it's, this may be, an, it, I'd be interested in your reaction to this. The first is, that with victims, unless you affirm their victimhood, you're hating them. The second thing is, though, that if you then meet their demands, there's not a sort of, gee, thanks for that, I was in a bad way, you've helped me. It's, well, I was entitled to it. It's the entitlement thing. Yeah. Um, I think uh, one thing we need to note, actually, is that the pathologies that we've been talking about uh, are no longer confined to universities. Uh, you. you you probably followed the controversy about the um, soft young software engineer, James Damore, mm. who worked for Google, or he worked for Google until they sacked him. And um, what happened there is profoundly disturbing when you think of the immense significance of, of a company like Google, I mean, in controlling and filtering the flow of information and, and social media more generally, which is increasingly where, you know, especially young people are getting their news from. And um, the circumstances surrounding his case are really quite extraordinary. What happened was um, Google had an internal staff meeting about diversity uh, at the conclusion of which, apparently, uh, those present were invited to submit their views. 
Well, uh, he submitted uh, his view, he wrote a 10-page memo, uh, where he made the case that, uh, a strat you know, that um, aspiring to a fifth, you know, one of the, one of the issues uh, is the low proportion of women in so-called STEM occupations, including software engineering, which is what he was working in. And, um, you know, he, he uh, had the temerity su to suggest that it wasn't all due to sexism and uh, uh, discrimination against women, but, um, and then he referred to research, which is actually quite robust, that shows that uh, women have comparable attitude, aptitudes to men, but they tend to have different preferences as to the style of work that they're interested in. And, and, you know, it's summed up by saying uh, women are more, you know, have a greater propensity to want to work with people, whereas men have a, you know, these are population-wide averages that don't apply to individuals necessarily, but men have more of an interest in, uh, in working with things, you know, objects, systems, and so forth. I mean, they're, they're population-wide generalisations, and there's huge overlap. So no, 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 nobody's yeah. saying that a woman shouldn't consider a career in software engineering, quite the contrary, and he, he actually made some constructive suggestions as, as to how that, to make that more amenable to women. But he, he said that, you know, if you, if you aspire to a 50-50 split in, soft, in the workforce in software engineering, uh, you know, you're not likely to get it, and, and, and there needs to be some recognition that there are sort of reasons for that. Anyway, so he was invited to, to provide, you know, all these people at this gathering were invited to provide their views. He provided his. He gave, uh, laid out an argument, a 10-page memo, he cited research, etc. cetera. Um, so uh, what did Google do? Well, they fired him summarily and uh, had him escorted off the premises. You know, I mean, this, you know, you think about universities, but this is central to the kind of society we're going to have in future. If, if, if an organisation like Google has an internal culture like that, what's it going to mean for the way they, they control the flow of information? Uh, uh, you know, there are allegations, I don't know whether they're right or not, about that, you know, that they're um, uh, in different ways tweaking their algorithms to bias search results and uh, they're excluding or, or margin, you know, margin, this is not just on Google, but on YouTube, which Google owns, uh, it, 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 taking steps to marginalise certain views they don't like uh, by demonetising Google cha YouTube channels and so forth. But what does that say about an organisational culture? That to, to present a dissenting view, um, the, the, the specific uh, offence he was accused of was perpetuating gender stereotypes. So to, to write a paper when invited to provide your views that can be construed as perpetuating gender stereotypes is an offence warranting summary dismissal. I mean... Yeah, it's th pretty this is, this revealing. Really yeah. mind-boggling. One of the uh, things that, for me, arises out of this sort of obsession with political correctness that you see... Uh, you know, people talk about the elites or whatever, and you, you heard about it with Trump and people rejecting it. I wonder why highly intelligent can't, people can't see how undemocratic this is perceived to be by ordinary men and women who are becoming increasingly frustrated. Uh, I can't remember who it was who said it. Now it, it might have been uh, George Bernard Shaw commenting on some idea that was put to him. He said, that's so ridiculous that only a member of the intelligentsia would believe it for a moment. No man in the street would accept it. There's an immense sense of frustration out there in voter land, if I can put it that way, that I pick up. Uh, you know, you and I have both been in the political game. We have political antennae. It seems to me, though, when you hear of stories like that, um, what is it that people don't get about their behaviour when they're so narrow? Well, the, uh, it's interesting, the, the American social theor theorist, uh, Charles Murray, uh, I think he's been platformed he's, too. He's been no platformed at uh, Middlebury College. They, they, the <laughs> students all packed out his meeting and turned their backs on him when he started to speak and shouted and yelled and carried on. And when he and the academic who invited him left the campus, uh, the, the professor, uh, who uh, woman professor who invited him, got uh, assaulted and had ended up in a neck brace. You know, this is modern campus life. Um, 
but he, he wrote a book called Coming Apart, uh, uh, mm. referring to the American context, where he, he uh, basically talked about the way society is separating into two broad categories. You, you've got the the, the elite knowledge workers who tend to live on the coasts in, in the American context, and, and then you've got um, the people who uh, do ordinary jobs and earn a living the hard way, and um, not like us politicians, um, but but who who uh, just two completely separate worlds that, that just don't communicate, just don't understand each other. There's an interesting article in, in the, um, the American Interest, a journal called The American Interest, by one, one of their main writers in the lead-up to the last uh, American election. He said, the circles he mixed in, in, in Washington, D.C., academia, top levels of government, business, etc., um, he, he didn't know anybody who was voting for Trump. And uh, so who are these people who are voting for Trump? And he decided like a sort of... A, anthropologists to go out and study these, but you know, try and fi find them and study them and so forth. It, it, so the two worlds are becoming alien. Yeah. Um, and and this, this is just profoundly unhealthy. I think it is because I'm a great believer in participatory liberal democracy as we've known it, but I think it does depend on, if you like, the understanding of a shared humanity uh, and a willingness to identify things we have in common rather than emphasise the differences all the time. Can I um, uh, come back and explore a couple of the other things that we've uh, touched on? Um, the left has plainly changed over the years. Um, I recently heard uh, an old man in the UK talking about uh, uh, his days with what he regarded as a very honourable socialist movement in the 40s, 50s, into the 60s. And he said in those days we were very, very much about trying to improve the lot of working men and women, something I would have thought in that context of the times and Britain in those years, very honourable indeed. And he said something that really sort of took me back. He said, today's working class people need to realise that uh, most of the left is no longer so much interested in addressing their disadvantage and helping them. They've come almost to see them as the problem because they're more committed to the environment and think that those people out there who are driving cars and aspiring to better houses and heating in the houses and a plasma television are the enemy of the environment, for want of a better way. You know, Gaia, I think I've heard it called by, by some of the Greens. Do you, any comments on how the left has, has, has moved in recent well, years? I, I should stress I, I've been quite critical of the, what you might call the postmodern or... Uh, regressive left as the term it's come into uh, vogue. But I think there are, uh, I still consider myself a leftist in the sense that I think a society characterised by steep social hi hierarchies and gross inequalities is not what we want. Mm. And uh, there are structural factors and technological factors which are tending to drive inequality ever greater and it is going to be ever more of a problem. The prospect of a grossly unequal societies becoming is something that which which I think is a major concern, and and you you need a, a decent left, a non-identity politics left, uh, to address that. But uh, as you say, again, the, the American election encapsulates the problem. The um, there was an, an interesting piece in the Washington Post by one of the Democratic Party's pollsters, uh, and this pollster had the job of. Um, taking samples in several key states and monitoring how, not monitoring how they were responding to the issues as they arose in, 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 as the campaign unfolded. And the real inflection point in the campaign, and this was a, a Democratic Party pollster, was Hillary's deplorable statement. Because mm. out there, yeah. in the suburbs and, and so on, in, uh, in the Midwest and in the Rust Belt and so forth, People just perceive that as an attack on them. And uh, Clinton's campaign um, really didn't tr even try to address the concerns of those people. In fact, the, 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 you know, it camp there were some leaks by campaign workers who talked about how she wasn't interested in attending events that 
those sort of people might be interested, like a Catholic club in, in, in Ohio or something like that. You know, they'd be met with the response, oh, we're not targeting that demographic, which is really quite remarkable because, you know, the low-income whites were a key part of the uh, Democratic Party coalition going back to the days of FDR to, to simply write them off in that way is, is really quite incredible. And uh, in the UK, uh, Corbynism, if you look at it, 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 it's something that's got, that's aiming for various ethnic constituencies, it's aiming for, you know, the, uh, the, the left liberal elites. Yeah, I, I think uh, there is a role and a useful role for uh, left-wing politics, but it has to be of a fund, it has to be stripped of this poison of, uh, of identity politics, which I think is just so corrosive and destructive. I wonder uh, another subset of all of this that, that intrigues me is that when I was at university, much of the left decried the idea of marriage. It was seen as outdated, oppressive, some pretty strong language actually about the need to get rid of marriage because of its impact on women and so forth was extant. Now um, it seems that many of those people believe, if you believe what they say they believe, that marriage is indeed a bedrock institution in society and it's very important and everyone should have access to it. I wonder whether in fact that isn't partly because of an obsession with identity politics. Another way of putting it, when did the left start to believe in marriage again? The, um, it's an interesting question. The, uh, Julia Gillard, uh, when she was challenged over her failure to support um, same-sex marriage, uh, made exactly that point. Well, she, she said, well, you know, the left used to decry marriage. Well, I think the, uh, the a point about, one point about this is that if you look at the way that, you know, family law has evolved and the common law and so forth, the all the substantive things you associate with marriage in terms of mm. property and custody, all these sorts of things, is, right uh, is pretty much extended to de facto relations, uh, whether between uh, diff different genders or, or same sex. I, I think that's... Um, so really, in terms of the substance, there's, there's, uh, it, it's really about the symbolism of, of calling it marriage. Now, so I, I favour uh, you know, legalising same-sex marriage and legislating for it. But the way this debate has been conducted, again, um, the, the kerfuffle over the Cooper's Brewery thing where, where, they, where they had, um, there were two people presented in a video, Tim Wilson and somebody else, uh, arguing both sides of that debate. Um, Cooper's Brewery was pilloried for that. Because it's not, you know, you're not allow, actually allowed to hear both points of view. Yeah, so and the other aspect of it that I find mind-boggling, what's happened to our sense of humour? Oh, yeah. What has yeah. happened to our sense of humour? You, you heard about the Sir Tim Hunt case, did you? Oh, yeah. Uh, Sir Tim Hunt uh, is a uh, British um, molecular biologist, extremely distinguished uh, Nobel laureate in medicine 2001, okay? Um, Distinctions galore, you know, a lifetime's contribution to, to medicine. Um, he uh, was destroyed overnight. His career and reputation mm. were destroyed overnight. What did he do? What was his great heinous crime? He, uh, when he was addressing a, a conference of science journalists in Seoul, in, in uh, South Korea, he, uh, he made a sort of a self-deprecating joke about how old fogies like him worry about women in the laboratory uh, who, uh, uh, you know, might cry and might fall in love with, with him and, uh, or something, you know, something to that effect. And then he said, but don't take any notice of that, I'm just a stupid old fogey or something to that effect. And it's very important that, that women go into science. So that's what he said. And within 24 hours, a Twitter storm erupted, which omitted the last bit I just mentioned. And uh, literally before his plane um, left Seoul and bef literally before it landed back in London, um, 
his career had been destroyed. His, his wife was called into University College London where he had a professorship and uh, uh, it was made very clear that, that he was going to have to vacate the position. Uh, he was... Um, the Royal Society disowned him. You know, this is the most distinguished and venerable science institution, scientific institution in the world, disowned him. Uh, the European Research Council, which he uh, was involved in setting up, he was forced out of that. This all happened in 48 hours. So you, a, a Twitter storm uh, based on a, a, a misreport of a triviality destroys the career of a, uh, of a scientist of immense distinction. Uh, that frightens people. People are frightened. Yeah, well, this and is the world we live in. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll give you another example more closer to home, uh, one that had, didn't receive anything like the attention it should have. Professor Barry Spur yeah. from Sydney University. University Sydney. Professor Barry Spur, he was a professor, professor of poetry and poetics. Um, he had a 40 year association with the university. Okay, and uh, if you read accounts that came out after he, he was, he lost his job. He, um, the students in his classes were just glowing. You know, this is this is a, a field where you have these boring postmodernists droning onto. <laughs> yeah, you know, his lectures were just packed, and yeah. people sitting in the aisles. And I, I knew him. He, yeah, he, he was a well, colourful well, character. World-renowned uh, expert on, yeah. on T.S. Eliot, etc. Um, somebody hacked into his email account and, and, and emails he'd sent to several people which included racist terms, which he insisted were being used in a, as part of a kind of ironic word game. Uh, this got leaked out. Mm. And again, the, 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 you know, the mobs were demonstrating outside his office. Um, Again, literally within 24 hours. It's this, this was within 24 hours. Um, he was out of a job. And not only dismissed, but banned from setting foot on any campus of the University of Sydney. It would have to be just about the most disgraceful thing that, that's happened in Australian higher education in a very long time. I, I, mean, I can't think of a parallel. To, but to treat a figure like that as if he was... Um, you know, you'd almost think he was a terrorist or something. He had to be, he was toxic. He had to be excluded from every. He wasn't even allowed to clean out his own desk. Really? You know, it had to be done for him. Peter, it's been great talking to you. But, you know, we have these conversations and the beauty of this is that you and I would probably disagree on lots of things. But we can identify far more important things that we do agree on. Not least of all that we have to have respectful um, uh, respect-based, if you like, debates with one another uh, on a mutual understanding that uh, we both have standing. I'm, I'm not more important than you and you're not more important than me in the overall scheme of things. Um, if we can see it and if we can model it, surely there's a great appetite in the Australian community for it. But you've been talking about breaking down the old divisions because they're not relevant between, you know, conservatives, liberals, well, whatever. Yeah. Would you just uh, take us home, land I mean, us there, by there, saying there, what we ought to be doing? There, there, certainly, uh, there are traditional left-right divisions uh, are not completely irrelevant. I'm not suggesting that. But, and, and but what, 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 what it seems to me is that there are certain core civilizational issues that we need to come together on. And we've talked a lot today about freedom of speech. We've talked a lot about a preparedness to acknowledge the, the magnitude of what the kind of civilization we habit, inhabit uh, has been able to achieve. The, um, you, know, the, you know, our civilization is partly a, a Judeo-Christian Judeo inheritance and partly an Enlightenment inheritance. And depending on your point of view, you'll put different emphases on, on those, uh, those uh, different elements. But, um, if you look at the world today, we see uh, some tremendous challenges emerging to the kind of civilization that we've had. You've got the, the, the re-emergence of autocratic great powers, China, Russia. Um, in the old Cold War, there was a kind of a hermetic separation yeah. between the Soviet bloc and our societies. But now, uh, in, especially in the case of China, the, the, it's infused right in. 
in, in financial ways in, in terms of trade relations, but the, the controversies about donations uh, and, and the way uh, politics can be reshaped. I, I think there are some tremendous concerns there that, uh, that pose a challenge to, you know, the very fact that the, the global correlation of forces has moved against the liberal democracies. And the problem with the culture debate, the identity politics debate, is, uh, uh, and uh, sorry, I, I should say the other great challenge facing Western societies, most of them anyway, is, is the challenge of political Islam, which is a very different way of looking at the world. I mean, uh, where the, the, the distinction we have in the West between the civil and religious realms just doesn't exist in Islam. And the, and the Europeans are having to, to grapple with that in a very profound way where we, you're seeing the emergence of parallel societies. So you've got that set of profound challenges and what we need to recognise is whether you're a traditional social democrat, as, as, as I am, or whether you're a classical liberal or whether you're a, a conservative, there's an awful lot that ought to unite us yes. in preserving those central features of our civilization. And that, you know, the political debate needs to pivot around those matters much more than it has. And we can argue about what the industrial relations framework should be or how progressive the tax system should be or, or, or how interventionist the government should be in the economy. Those, those are not, not trivial issues, they're important issues. But they're, in, our, in our era, I think they are subsidiary to these core existential civilizational questions. And I agree 100%. Thank you very much indeed.